Hey everyone, welcome back. Let's move on now to chapter 16, which is on carbohydrates. And there was very much a method to my madness in choosing to do uh, the chapters in this order because carbohydrates structurally are nothing more than polyhydroxyaldehydes and polyhydroxyketones. And we already studied hydroxy compounds, if you will, namely alcohols back in chapter seven, not all that long ago. And we just finished a chapter on aldehydes and ketones. That was chapter nine. So I think the timing is extraordinarily good to cover another one of our uh, biochem related chapters. Uh, as always, uh, usual disclaimer, I am not a biochemist, uh, and I don't feel it's our job to cover biological function in this class. That's uh, a perfectly fine topic, it's just not organic chemistry. And I think you will cover that in more detail uh, in your biology and biochem classes later on. But what they will not cover in those classes, most likely, uh, that we can uh, provide, we organic chemists can provide a, as a perspective is the, is the um, let's say, is the focus on structure and on reactivity of these compounds. And uh, I think it will be good background for you going on to those upper level biology and biochem classes to, to have someone walk you through the structures of these compounds just as we did with nucleic acids, just as we did with lipids, because those are exactly the things that they will not talk about in those upper level classes. So, uh, like we said, carbohydrates, all of them. Uh, first of all, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time convincing you of the importance of carbohydrates uh, as one of the main fuel sources for both, uh, well, for all life on Earth, really. Uh, and so, uh, Carbohydrates are molecules that have uh, at least one aldehyde or ketone functional group and also a whole bunch of OH groups, a whole bunch of hydroxy groups. Uh, the reason they got that name carbohydrate sounds like hydrate of carbon. Uh, and the reason is because most carbohydrates have a formula at least something close to CnH2nON. Uh, or which you can almost think about like this. Uh, of course, that's not really the structure of any real carbohydrate. You don't take a bunch of carbons and stick water molecules all over. But in terms of their molecular formula, they look as though that's what they were or something close to it. So for instance, uh, glucose is C6H12O6. That's its formula and it's as if it contains six carbons and six waters. Uh, sucrose table sugar is C12H22O11, looks like 12 carbons and 11 waters, pretty close, not exactly, but pretty close. So that for, that, for that reason, these molecules were called carbohydrates, hydrates of carbon, even though they aren't literally hydrates of carbon. It's as if they were. Good. Uh, there are many ways of uh, um, conceptually breaking down carbohydrates. Uh, those carbohydrates are sugars that contain aldehyde groups, we call them aldoses, and those that contain ketone functional groups, we call ketoses, uh, and simple sugars, monosaccharides as they're called, which is what we're going to focus on in, in this video, those can also be classified by how many carbon atoms are in them. Uh, and I think you will find that you need at least three carbons to have a molecule that acts at all like a sugar. Uh, so the simplest carbohydrates of three carbons, and those are D and L glyceraldehyde, which we'll get to in a moment, and the only other three carbon sugar, I'm here showing you the structure because I think you'll run into it eventually uh, when you start talking about metabolism, is dihydroxyacetone. Uh, you might have heard of DHAP or dihydroxyacetone phosphate. It simply is one of the H's on one of the OH groups replaced with a phosphate. So dihydroxyacetone is the only other possible triose or three carbon sugar. Uh, I don't think we're really going to look at any tetroses. We're not really going to so much look at pentoses either, although we have already seen two of them. We've seen ribose and deoxyribose in, uh, in chapter 18 on nucleic acids, so those are pentoses. But we're going to mainly focus on the hexoses and especially on the aldohexoses. So those six carbon sugars that have an aldehyde functional group. 
and uh, we're even going to narrow it down further. And I think we're mainly going to be looking at at uh, uh, the D aldohexoses mainly. Uh, so those six carbon sugars that have an aldehyde functional group and are in what's known as the D configuration. So here we go again. We already hit R and S, which is a way of categorizing uh, molecules by the stereochemistry around any and all chiral centers. Uh, we didn't actually go over how to determine RNS, but you recognize those two terms. And you know uh, any given molecule with a carbon in the R configuration will have, in principle, an enantiomer with the uh, corresponding carbon in the S configuration. That's different from the plus minus system, which was used before then which was fine except determining whether something was the plus isomer or the minus isomer required doing an experiment. And now we come to the DNL system, which, is, which biologists and biochemists use a lot. And that is decided based on a particular structural feature of the molecule, especially, uh, especially uh, the relationship of some group on the next to last or penultimate carbon. And penultimate is just a $60 word meaning uh, uh, next to last. So uh, in the case of sugars, that's uh, an OH group. In the case of amino acids, which we'll get to in our chapter on amino acids and proteins, that's going to be an amino group of some kind. Unfortunately, and I, I don't think I can really tell you why this is, but unfortunately, it is the D sugars that are natural and the L amino acids that are natural. Again, I couldn't really tell you why that is, but, but uh, that's why you'll see a lot of talk about D sugars, D glyceraldehyde, D glucose, D galactose, all that in this chapter. It's the D sugars that are natural. The L sugars, like L glyceraldehyde, do exist. They're just not natural. They don't occur naturally in living systems. So uh, let's start with glyceraldehyde, since uh, that's one of the simplest ones. And the structure of D-glyceraldehyde, which again is the natural one, is as you see here. And we say a sugar is in, is in the D form when uh, the OH group on the next to last carbon, that is the one right above the CH2OH group, so here's your penultimate carbon over there, uh, is pointing to the right. And in order to do that, we'll always, by convention, put the carbonyl group, whether it's an aldehyde or a ketone. Again, I'm, I'm assuming and hoping that when you see CHO, you know what that means. You understand that's an aldehyde functional group. C double bond O with an H attached to the carbon, right? And it, you, you, it's, it's, it's an abbreviation that you may use. If you don't like the abbreviation, it's never mandatory for you to use those abbreviations. All I ask is that when you see them, you understand them. And, and this is one of them, CHO4 aldehyde functional group. And so uh, D-glyceraldehyde has the penultimate OH uh, pointing to the right. L-glyceraldehyde will be the enantiomer. It'll have the OH group that's the, on the penultimate carbon pointing to the left. And we saw structures like this earlier. Uh, and these really are short, these really can be shortened further using something known as a Fischer projection. And so if I were to show you the Fischer projection of D-glyceraldehyde, it would look like this. And you see, basically what we do is we, uh, we, uh, we, we leave it as understood that all of the horizontal bonds are wedge bonds. We draw them as straight lines, but to us it's understood that those are coming out of the paper at us. And all of the vertical bonds are going to be receding away from us. So those, those were our dotted bonds over here. And one other very critical thing that we must always remember to do when we're drawing Fischer projections, we do not put letter Cs on those carbon atoms that are on the main chain over there. We leave those as just intersections. That's very important because if you put a letter C there, it is no longer a Fischer projection. It's a valid structure, but it's no longer a Fischer projection. It no longer implies any stereochemistry. So those are, are the two really critical parts. Now, another thing, you might have noticed in the book that they tend to not draw the H's. They tend to just leave it as a stick like that. I'm not a fan of that. 
And I, I'm not going to recommend that you learn drawing them that way. Because I think for us it's confusing. I think it's confusing. It kind of looks like it might be a methyl group. So let's always draw those H's when, when, uh, when we're drawing Fisher projections. And later on also when we draw Hayworth projections, which are coming up later. And so in L-glyceraldehyde, the penultimate OH is pointing to the left. And again, L-glyceraldehyde does exist. It's just not a natural molecule. It needs to be synthesized in the lab. So that's the enantiomer of D-glyceraldehyde. But D-glyceraldehyde occurs naturally in living systems. And so we already talked about dihydroxyacetone. If we extend this further to the idea of a hexose, this here is, is the structure of D-glucose. I'm not a real fan either of memorizing, but if there were two structures that you memorized, I think you would find it useful to memorize the structure of D-glyceraldehyde and when you do that, by the way, you automatically get L-glyceraldehyde thrown in for free. That's useful because that will help you to remember which is D and which is L. And then the only other one I would ask you to memorize is that of D-glucose. The way I do it is I just remember the OHs are right, left, right, right. So right, left, right, right is D-glucose. And again, notice the OH group on the penultimate carbon is pointing to the right. That's how we know that it's a D-sugar. So L-glucose would be the opposite in all of the chiral carbons. So L-glucose instead of right, left, right, right, would be left, right, left, left. That would be the enantiomer of D-glucose, sometimes called invert sugar. And it does exist. Uh, it's just not natural. It doesn't occur naturally. So what if you changed not all four of them, but just some of them? Well, that all depends. If you changed, of course, the penultimate carbon, you'll switch between a D-sugar and an L-sugar. Uh, but that leaves three other carbons that, that don't change, whether it's a D-sugar or, or an L-sugar. And so if you think about it, there's two possibilities for each of these. So two times two times two, or two cubed is eight possibilities. And so that means there's going to be eight D-aldohexoses, of which D-glucose is one of them. You'll find, uh, uh, I should have written down the page of your textbook, that it shows you what all of the eight D-aldohexoses are. Anyway, you do not, repeat, not have to memorize all eight of them. I don't think that's a good use of your time. And anyway, for my money, if you know the structure of D-glucose, then in principle, you know all the other seven by comparison. So for example, if I told you to draw D-galactose, where galactose is just like glucose, except it differs at carbon four. Well, carbon one is gonna be the uppermost, the aldehyde carbon, so one, two, three, four. It means that you would flip the H and the OH just on this carbon, and you will get the structure of D-galactose. So that, that's why I say I don't think there's any point in your memorizing all eight. You might have that pleasure in an upper level biology or biochem class, not here. I'm happy if you just know the structure of D-glucose, because then if I give you enough instructions, which I would, you could draw the structure of any of the other D-aldohexoses. Good, so so much for the so-called open chain form of, uh, of D-glucose. So uh, we always, by convention, number from uh, the carbon that we, by convention, write at the top, which in the case of the aldose, that's going to be the aldehyde carbonyl carbon. Uh, so that, that's just that's just, that's just the way it's done. That's the, the conventional way of numbering those six carbons in, in a hexose. Good. So uh, we've already here covered uh, Fisher projections, and we've gone over this. I also need to tell you uh, that the straight chain form that you see here of glucose is, is one of several forms that glucose takes when you dissolve glucose in water. And just as we finished discussing in, in chapter nine, what can happen is that you can form a hemiacetal. And the hemiacetal winds up being between uh, that all important penultimate OH group and the aldehyde carbon. And so uh, I really, honestly, I find the whole issue of how it is that we get from this molecule and we bend and we twist it and we turn around this bond and we put this thing over there and so forth. I, I, I will confess to you, I find that whole question quite boring. So I can only imagine how you find it. 
but uh, my experience is that students, at least some students, always want to, want to be shown exactly how that's done so that I can prove to them that we get from this straight chain form to these two uh, cyclic forms. And so that's what I've done here. Uh, and so we call these two six-membered cyclic forms of glucose uh, the pyranose forms of glucose. And there are two of them. They're both hemiacetals, cyclic hemiacetals. And we just finished talking about hemiacetals and, and how it is that we go from from an aldehyde and an OH to, to a hemiacetal. So we just finished that in chapter nine. The mechanism is identical. And the reason these are called pyranoses is because the parent compound pyran is this compound here. It's a six-membered ring with five carbons and an oxygen. Uh, and pyran itself has two double bonds, as you see here. If the, same, the same compound with all, all single bonds would be called tetrahydropyran. And so it's really on that, uh, on that stencil, if you will, that we make, uh, that we make the, uh, the pyranose forms. And so these are what they look like. And I, I, I certainly do not expect you to memorize any of these cyclic forms, least of all the furanose forms, which are coming next. But I would like you to understand that how we get there, namely by forming a cyclic hemiacetal using exactly the same reaction mechanism that we just covered in chapter nine. And so, of course, there's two possible hemiacetals that are different from one another. These are called the beta and alpha anomers. And the one when drawn like this, where the OH of the hemiacetal points up, we call the beta anomer. And the one where the OH group points down, we call the alpha anomer. And the way I remember this, you can probably come up with a better, uh, mnemonic device than I can. The way I remember it is that the vowels and consonants don't go together. So in the beta, we have the OH pointing up. B is a consonant, U is a vowel. In uh, the alpha anomer, we have the OH pointing down. A is a consonant, D is a, is a vowel, D is a consonant. So they don't go together. So that's how I remember. And the whole process of this compound opening up back to the straight chain form and then forming the other anomer in either direction, that goes by the rather fancy name muta rotation. But it simply refers to going from uh, one anomer to the other. And again, it's the same exact reaction we talked about in chapter nine. So uh, when you dissolve glucose in water, you will have some of the uh, straight chain form, admittedly not much, probably only a few percent. And you will have both of these uh, pyranose forms, both anomers, and you will also have both anomers of the furanose forms, which I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on because uh, we're not really going to use them. Uh, but uh, but uh, I'll nonetheless show you how they come about. Same type of idea. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the OH group in carbon four that, uh, that adds into that aldehyde carbonyl carbon. And so you get a five-membered ring. And the reason these are called furanoses is because they're built on a five-membered ring with four carbons and an oxygen. The original parent molecule is called furan. You might recall in the ethers chapter us talking about tetrahydrofuran, which is the reduced form, so all single bonds. And so all of these contain that type of five-membered ring. And so both, indeed, both of these also, the alpha and beta anomers, Will, will, be, will be at some levels or some concentrations in solution. And there's a rapid mobile equilibrium between all of these different forms. And if you wanted to, you could look up the percent of each of them at a given concentration of glucose at a given temperature, probably. I certainly don't care if you memorize any of those, but I would like you to be aware that all of these are present. I think the main important structure for you to memorize is the straight chain form of glucose. So uh, I think that's all we need to say there. I also want to point out, though, that it is also possible uh, to draw these, uh, these cyclic forms uh, using the same type of chair forms we used with cyclohexanes, as well as using these kind of flattened structures, which we call Hayworth projections, which reminds me another thing about these Hayworth projections which again, I don't really care if you memorize them, but I would like you to be able to look at structures similar to this and understand what's going on and understand what you're looking at. So um, 
uh, your book does the same, which actually, no, now that I think of it, I, I've seen this, this hack also. Uh, just like they did with the Fisher projections, they'll also draw the H's on the Hayworth projections just as sticks. And again, I'm not a fan of that. I don't recommend you do that. Let's at least for this class draw them uh, with drawing in the letter H's for the hydrogens. Again, even though your future exams will still be multiple choice, you're going to be drawing some things in your notes. So let's get used to drawing the H's. If your biochem professor or your biology professor leaves them out, we'll cut them some slack. But for now, just to avoid confusion, we'll, we'll write in the H's. So what about these chair forms? And I want to uh, end with these. It's just another way of showing the same thing. It might be a little more, uh, a, a little more friendly seeming to us, really, since we're used to seeing cyclohexane chairs. The, um, the, the strength of Hayworth projections is they make it very easy to see what's pointing up and what's pointing down. Uh, but the, the expense of that is the bond angles are all wonky. So uh, the only way to show the bond angles correctly is to use these chair forms. And so these are what the beta and alpha anomers of D-glucose look, like, uh, look like in the chair forms. I certainly don't expect you to memorize these either, but I would like you to notice something about these two chair forms, which is that apart from the OH on the so-called anomeric carbon, which is carbon one, the carbon that used to be the aldehyde carbon, uh, that can be either up or down, uh, or this, in this case, it, it's up and also equatorial. Here it's down and also axial. But look at all of the other functional groups on both of them, OH, 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 CH2OH. You see something interesting about all four of those, those uh, attachments. They are all equatorial. And I don't know why that is. But for some reason, on both beta and alpha D-glucose, if, the, the, uh, if you draw the pyranoses using chairs, like we did for cyclohexanes, using chairs of this particular shape with the oxygen back here, uh, for some reason, ex again, except for at the anomeric carbon, uh, for some reason, all of the other non-hydrogens are equatorial. It's a wonderful coincidence, but it is, as far as I can tell, just a coincidence. Anyway, that's a good place to end. Uh, next time, we'll continue on to talk a little bit about dye and polysaccharides, not very much, and also about the reactions that simple sugars can undergo. So uh, that's basically that. So have a great day. We'll see you next time.